Thomas Chord said something very interesting about desire and the fulfillment of desires in his book, The Hidden Power. He said, Desire is the force behind all things. It is the moving principle of the universe and the innermost center of all life. Hence, to take the negation of desire or our primal principle is to endeavor to stamp out life itself. But what we have to do is to acquire the requisite knowledge by which to guide our desires to their true objects of satisfaction. Desire is the sum total of the livingness of life, for it is that in which all movement originates, whether on the physical level or the spiritual. In a word, desire is the creative power and must be carefully guarded. And desire has fulfillment for its correlative. The desire and its fulfillment are bound together as cause and effect. And when we realize the law of their sequence, we shall be more than ever impressed with the supreme importance of desire as the great center of life. I love how he says, desire and its fulfillment are bound together as cause and effect. You see, every cause has an effect relationship. And what he's saying here to match is that each desire has its relationship with the effect of fulfillment. So our purpose, if we choose to accept it, and we always have a choice, is to fulfill our heart's desires in life. Or we could say, accept them as already fulfilled. And this is the hidden, or we could say, occulted secret that they were already done for us and that we can have what we desire. And by occulted, it means hidden by ignorance caused by certain self-imposed beliefs in mind that create veils of deception and separation. And so we get to choose what to experience and how we want to live in this physical life, which is inspired through the language of desire. As Neville Goddard once said, the spiritual self speaks to the natural self through the language of desire. Now, upon reflection of my life, I realized that this is true, that the desires were fulfilled some way, somehow, and as I experience them and continue to experience them in my life, it turns out that way. There was a desire for prosperity, a desire to share this message now, and even a desire to understand the nature of desire. And what I realized is that these desires of the heart are sacred. The language of the spiritual self speaking and that stated, it's up to each person, or we could say personal self, to accept them as already fulfilled as we see so much unnecessary suffering is caused by not fulfilling desires, which means accepting them as already done for you, allowing ourselves to have them, we could say. And so I've seen in my life before and some I've worked with that ignorance of desire being already fulfilled, lay at the root of unnecessary suffering. And why? Well, from my experience, I found that it was because of beliefs, and more accurately put, beliefs that suppressed, shamed, or denied desire. Also, notably worth mentioning, I've seen beliefs that distort desire causing one to think that what they want was a certain thing. Although, meanwhile, it was an imagining from a past undesirable belief, and thus not a true desire. Only confused as true desire, 
Although upon reflection, clearly not. This is why I believe Steve Jobs mentioned in his commencement speech. To have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. You see the part, truly want to become, not falsely want to become. Steve was big on nuances when it came to Apple, and I hear it in his words. One word, truly want to become. So the key point thus far is discernment between desire and beliefs, which could distort. And how does one know? Well, it's a very personal and sacred journey, which can be easily deciphered if we overlay our journey of life with the seven stages of spiritual alchemy, which we'll discuss in a moment. Now, I believe physical life is a mirror reflection of the spiritual journey. The illusion of separation in between desire and fulfillment is only caused by certain subconscious beliefs in mind. God is dreaming this world through your natural self, and never shaming or condemning. Shame and condemnation are only beliefs created and identified with in mind by the individual. And thus mind and beliefs are not a problem. It is the identification to certain beliefs in mind that when released during the spiritual alchemy process allows us to accept that desire and fulfillment are one. So we can have what we truly desire and allow ourselves to be how we truly desire to be on the journey to realizing our desires. Now, I value the journey and the destination, and I see them as one. Desire and fulfillment are one, and they can be experienced that way, which I call flow. And from there, the way and how it is done for us, as in the natural self, happens by the unseen power within us. So simply put, when we desire something and commit to it, it plays out alongside whatever else we have believed to be true as a story of journey to the destination. The reality is, that in its essence, it's one, as Thomas George stated when he said, desire in its fulfillment are bound together as cause and effect. Now, when I say at its essence, they are one, it is true. The experiences in this world may only appear as separation due to identification with separation-based beliefs. So you see, the world is a reflection of the contents of your mind. Your mind, which in essence is purely blank, like a child born into the world. It's only through imaginings that beliefs are formed which manifest automatically. So this is simply a journey of accepting that you already are all that you desire to be now. And thus notice, as we discuss the process, that this is two parts happening at the same time as all there truly exists in this moment is now. Past and future, although purely imaginal to the natural self, is a present whole to the spiritual self. And that's also why we have clairvoyance and intuition or messages received by, let's say, the holy guardian angel. And by the way, if you'd like to hear me discuss more about holy guardian angel, you could type holy guardian angel in the comments or something like that, and I'll make a dedicated video for it. So again, two parts happening now. Acceptance of the desire as fulfilled and the release of identification to beliefs, which is mind purification. And again, mind is 
already pure in its essence. We acknowledge that it's already pure by what we could call letting go of what is not true. And actually, letting go happens automatically. The unseen power does everything and thus takes care of everything for you, not against you. Acknowledged mind is not the enemy. In its essence, it is pure, like a child born into the world, where their mind is pure, and beliefs identified within the subconscious mind, not in harmony with how you truly desire to be, are also not enemy, because they can be easily released by acknowledging that they are actually looking to be released. So why would we create an enemy of a belief in mind that is looking to be released? That's unnecessary conflict in mind. The unseen does that releasing through that meta-belief. So we can allow them to release, and more accurately put, even this seeming allowing them to release also happens automatically, done by your unseen power. Now, I've discussed the spiritual alchemy process before a number of times, and I'll link in the description to some videos so you could look at it from different perspectives. And today we're going to discuss it through some more nuances from recent reflections, personal experiences, and experiences working with clients. So when I discuss the spiritual alchemy process, I tend to refer to it in an esoteric and exoteric integrated way because I actually believe them to be one. I found that the inner and outer actually happen at the same time where what appears as an outer journey is actually a reflection of the inward inner reconciliation of seeming differences, which were once creating unnecessary overthinking and emotional turmoil between desire and fulfillment, which was caused by identification to certain separation-based beliefs. So the mind gets reconciled and purified on the journey to realizing the vision as unnecessary identification to specific beliefs in mind that generate overthinking, emotional turmoil, or we could say dissonance are released. This reflects as outward changes. For example, I like financial prosperity and I like relationship prosperity. I don't consider them different in my mind, but rather an expression of prosperity in general. And thus, I don't have an inner conflict of one being better than another, which, if I did, could play out as prioritization conflicts. How could there be prioritization conflicts when they're actually accepted as one? And from that premise, everything happens automatically and ideally for me to harmonize the two in some shape or form as experiences in life by the unseen power of my subconscious mind. So when it comes to transformation, which includes mind purification and reconciliation, all of which occur on the spiritual alchemy process, areas of life like entrepreneurship and relationships, although appearing to occur outside as theater, are actually mirroring outside the theater of mind as reflections of the transformation in relation to them that occur within before they appear outside. They appear to transform as a theatrical play outside, which we can call a journey to destination or desire and fulfillment. Which is why in ancient Egypt, the birthplace of alchemy, Chem in alchemy was from land of Chem, one ancient name for Egypt. Art and speech, which is also an art, which my copywriter friends would agree. It was said that there were two gifts bestowed upon humanity. They were mind and speech. And they were to enjoy life as an art that it is. 
Remember, your essence is formless, and you give form to this world by your style or art of living. Your body thus is a sacred place. It is a conduit of mind, which is also a sacred place, as spirit dwells in and animates both of them to express outwardly. And it's quite the magical theater. For the woodworker, it appears the tree determines how it wants to be represented. For the writer, the words appear on their own. For the artist, the divine moves the body like a marionette. Paint and brushes come alive as they too are given free will to do everything for the artist. I used to have a uh, sport bike back in the days, a Yamaha R6. We used to get into the flow and become one. We entered into the spirit of each other so we could appreciate each other and take care of each other and represent each other respectfully. Anyone who owns a motorcycle knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's a spiritual way of life. This is the way of the alchemist. Spirit and matter are one with each other. So anything physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual can be your catalyst or muse for transformation. Listen to your heart and go for what you truly desire. There's no real need to allow opinions of this world to tell you how to be. Forget it. Know yourself. Go within and live how you truly desire to live. So first, in the spiritual alchemy process, we have calcination, the black stage, in which chaos is respected and represented. That which is hidden, perhaps suppressed and even repressed. When stimulated by desire, we are willing to step into the unknown. You see, with a burning desire, you have a flame that will never die out and will light the way as you travel in this world and also imagination, revealing the contents of mind. And you're safe in mind as you have your holy guardian angel or invisible counsel. And as stated in the Kabbalion, oh, let not the flame die out. Cherished age after age in its dark cavern, in its holy temples cherished, fed by pure ministers of love, let not the flame die out. And this is referring equally to inward and outward as alchemists see them as one. So whatever you choose as your muse, like a car, for example, I mentioned a while back that one of my muses when I started my business was to buy a Lamborghini. I not only wanted to buy one, but do it comfortably, be able to pay for maintenance comfortably, as well as only after I brought myself to a certain level of success in entrepreneurship. And what was interesting was when I got to that point, I no longer wanted to. I actually realized I fell in love with the journey and process of entrepreneurship. And even if there was no reward, I'd still do it because it's an art. It's how I truly desire to live. Although there are plenty of rewards which include money and much more. And so there's nothing wrong with owning one. You can have whatever you want. It was my muse that kept the desire flame burning for the next step of the process as well, in which calcination, any self-doubt from the unconscious could be brought to awareness when, for example, You are selling your services, where while your muse is there, and I mean your personal muse, go beyond the opinions of this world that seem to say you should or should not have this as your muse. This world is made up of beliefs anyway. We want to go beyond shame-based beliefs and ask ourselves an earnest question. What lights your fire? What 
fans your flames, as Rumi once said. Seek those who fan your flame. Then we have dissolution, bringing of the burnt ashes to waters. This is where perhaps intense emotions once suppressed are allowed to be experienced and released along with the beliefs that cause them to be experienced a certain way. This is where I always say the releasing occurs to identification to specific subconscious beliefs in mind. They are brought to awareness to be released, which simply means here in this context, feeling the emotion and allowing yourself to be anyways. For example, part of my journey was in 2010, doing many public speaking events through workshops where I felt strong emotions, which we could call fear or anxiety on days leading up to and even the first five minutes of the class. And I did them anyways as they were helping process the emotions while also releasing the identification to the beliefs that were creating unnecessary resistance between desire and fulfillment. And so I saw resistance as my friend. I would personify it in my mind and speak with it. I'd have an invisible counsel with it, alongside the holy guardian angel, all fun reconciliation theater in the mind. And I would do the events anyway, stimulated by desire, which all of this purified mind. This is what desire does. It purifies the mind, weaving the spiritual with the physical in bliss. And so when I look back at the resistance I had leading up to it, it was a good burn. And so I fell in love with the resistance. Again, the line from the Kabbalion. Oh, let not the flame die out, cherished age after age in its dark cavern in its holy temples cherished, fed by pure ministers of love. Let not the flame die out. And so we see how this information, which may have once been considered occulted, which again only means hidden, and we are only hiding it from ourselves by ignorance. And what is that ignorance? It's shame. Notice this. What creates the illusion of separation between the desires of the heart and the fulfillment of them is a lot of times shame-based beliefs. This is what created unnecessary resistance in me prior to doing the events. Shame-based beliefs. So I fell in love with the resistance. I said, what are you revealing to me? It said, you are identified with a belief of wanting people to accept you rather than accepting yourself the way you are now. So in dissolution, certain belief identification is brought to awareness to be released, a lot of times formed during past traumatic situations when children which also was the first time for me speaking with the holy guardian angel. Which is interesting because the same belief was released by conversations with it. This represents transformational theater of the mind, kind of like Carl Jung's idea of active imagination, which is a lot of fun. Which is why I always say mind purification can be fun and theatrical. And it doesn't have to be dull and boring. It's your choice. Then we have separation. At this stage of the journey to realizing the vision, the person has cultivated the ability to, from an unbiased and loving observer perspective of their experiences, which they had once surrendered their free will to a belief identified with in mind, which cause mind, emotion, and body to move like a puppet to that belief inside in an undesirable way. Now it no longer occurs. 
Instead, this is where they choose consciously how they truly desire to see the experience, which is ideal in relation to their vision. Then we have conjunction, which is also referred to as acceptance and integrating the parts of your authentic self. In this regard, I'm referring to encouraging and acknowledging the imaginal attributes that you would want to subconsciously integrate mentally and thus then physically embody in your world as life experiences. I like how Neville Goddard said it. You are the spiritual self, which is I. As a matter of fact, you could acknowledge it now easily by asking the question, who is aware now beyond this body and or any concept in mind? That is the observer which is sometimes referred to as the true self or no self. Now, imagination is your eternal body. This is where creation is initiated, as in you, true self, can imagine anything. You can see the contents in your mind's eye of eternity. So more accurately put, at a spiritual level, Acknowledgement that everything has already been created, as stated in the Bible, and thus already existing in imagination, and thus real to the spiritual self, just as this world is considered real and experiential to the physical self through a process we call creative expression based on embodying what we imagine as true for ourselves in mind. So the inner and outer are actually one. Although we can choose to experience life as a journey to destination, because we enjoy both, and that is life experience. Then we have fermentation. At this point, one could say the veils of illusion of how they see themselves in general, alongside how they see themselves in relation to their vision, people, environment, circumstance, information, etc., are removed. These veils of illusions are beliefs that once were distorting how they truly desire to be authentically and ideally. They are released. And again, we allow them to release. Otherwise, we could create unnecessary suffering in mind, which could play out as inharmonious behavior in relationships, for example, which some may refer to as forcing this world, which the appearance of forcing this world is what one could call lack of faith or trust. I prefer to see this as not allowing the identification to certain beliefs to be released when they were looking to be released anyways, which then trust and faith happen automatically as our true essence is already trust and faith. Then we have distillation. This is the integration of inner realizations or attributes of how one truly desires to be through self-talk or auto-suggestion or any embodiment practice, which for me included doing the workshops as mentioned. Auto-suggestions are simply in our mind's eye, which clearly sees the contents of eternity in imagination, choosing what we consider as ideal attribute, like clothes in a closet, from the infinite possibilities that already exist in imagination and saying to ourselves, I am that, or that is what I am. And then we feel satisfied doing this mentally, which is feeling it real, or feeling it as reality. From there, we also experience it in our emotions and physically, because we have accepted what we desire as already fulfilled. Again, it's like going into your closet and selecting what you desire to wear. 
From that premise, emotions in physical body expresses naturally, automatically, and ideally in relation to what was accepted as true. A person then lives more of a flow-based journey to realizing their vision because, remember, desire and fulfillment are one. Unnecessary suffering to this truth is caused by identification with separation-based beliefs in relation to desire and fulfillment. Then we have coagulation. This is experiential. I find the degree of this keeps amplifying more so each day. This is oneness with the divine, or we could say being experientially one with all. One might feel like I'm a star. I know my place in the cosmos. I know that I'm in harmony and in contribution with all. Spirit of harmony with all. The inner and outer is experienced as one. The world seems to dance to your tune, or is it? Are you dancing to the tune of the world, or are they dancing to your tune? Actually both, at the same time as they're both one. I like how James Allen said it so poetically. He said, The spiritual heart is the heart of the universe. And finding that heart, one finds the strength to accomplish all things. They find there also the wisdom to see things as they are. They find there the peace that is divine. At the center of our being is the music which orders the stars, the eternal harmony. So, desire and fulfillment are not truly separate as creation is complete and we're taught that all things exist in imagination. It is thus totally fine and I would even say ideal to allow yourself to have desires. They are promises of what you shall one day become. I worked with some who once allowed themselves, although unwillingly, to be brainwashed or shamed into eliminating desires, and they went on to believe that life was pointless. They said to me they lost their drive and motivation and could not get themselves to do what they want, and they wondered why. Ignoring their desires seemed to provide a temporary relief, only to lead to effects that were akin to disassociation. And helpful information was thus then occulted from them till a certain point when they knew something didn't feel right. Then the desire emerged again, and they went back to living naturally with a newfound zest for life. So certain beliefs and belief systems, if identified with, can cause information to appear as occulted. As also stated in the Kabbalion, the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. And so who closes the ears to wisdom? The individual, and more specifically, the belief identified with by the individual, which occulted the information which was always there and thus never kept from them. And information is neutral. It is how the information is applied based on free will to choose lovingly or allowing polarization to certain unlovely beliefs identified with in mind in relation to the information or certain aspects of the information that causes information to be applied unlovingly. And I suggest transcending all of that and consciously choosing lovingly by ceasing to shame and allowing yourself to have what you love. Also, allow your inspiration to remain at a peak like you were authentically designed to be. Rebecome a little child again. Seek those that fan your flames, as Rumi once said, which a child does automatically. They automatically seek those that fan their flames. 
And so let not the flame die out and enjoy your life. The mind purification happens automatically on the journey to realizing your desires. We simply allow it to happen. So I trust you found this video to be helpful. Let's conclude this with an auto suggestion to further encourage. You could say, I choose love. And upon choosing love, I choose life. And upon choosing life, I choose what I desire. Desires are the promises of what I shall one day become. Desire and fulfillment are one. And so I allow it to be done for me by the unseen power within me in love and spirit of harmony with all. To remold my entire world into the kingdom of love. If you would like a copy of this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk with you soon. Take care.